So, so namaste everyone, just quickly by way of introduction. I am the founder of Hindupedia, the online encyclopedia of Hindu Dharma. We also spend about 50% of our efforts, uh, probably more specifically on the top of Hindu Dwesha from about 2015 onwards. Um, Hindupedia started in 20, 2007 or so. Uh, Gundan is a professor at HUA and specifically focus around, focuses in history and social sciences. He also got engaged with Hindu Dwesha in California textbooks from 2017, but in general has spent probably the better part of the last 20 years uh, fighting Hindu academic Hindu Dwesha in its various forms over that entire period of time, going all the way back to when he was doing his PhD. Uh, so today we're going to talk about a few different things. Uh, one, why is Hindu uh, the narrative Hindu Dweshi? Uh, two, kind of what are the origins of Hindu Dwesha in the U.S. and in academia? Um, and, and then how does it impact us, right? Our children specifically, but us as a community. And then how do we deal with it? Do we want to fight it? Do we want to run away from it? Ignore it? How do we want? How as a community do we want to deal with it? Uh, we'll give you some insights from the actual eff uh, efforts in California, some of the things that worked, some of the things that didn't work, and some of the things that, that we saw. Um, and then finally, we'll close with the accomplishments since 2015 onwards. Um, both Gundan and I have been involved for a very long period of time. As I mentioned, Gundan's entire career, me starting from about 2016 or so. Um, but the accomplishments here are gonna focus specifically on California versus broader accomplishments. Um, and then the other thing is beyond California, the impact of the work on textbooks that it's had on everyone else. So, um, you know, the first topic is uh, basically outlining what the problem, you know, with the, what the, the textbooks are. And as it is said, that a picture is worth a thousand words. So when you uh, look at the pictures on your screen, you will clearly see that when Hinduism is being spoken about, it is described as a tradition which is uh, exotic. And if you look at uh, the two children who are carrying cow dung on their heads, uh, you will see that the message which is being conveyed is that Hinduism is oppressive. And uh, the two diagonal uh, pictures of the quadrant that you find basically suggests that Hindus uh, are dirty and filthy people, uh, been poor right from the very beginning. So these are some of the representations uh, that you basically find um, in, in, in the textbooks. And uh, if you would remember the last time that I was here, I had spoken about the origin of Hindu Dvesha or Hindu phobia. Uh, there's a long history to it, this narrative that you find in the textbooks. So, you know, we were talking about the uh, origins of Hindu Dvesha and the people who were here last time would remember that I've gone into great details in, into looking at the origin of Hindu Dvesha or the genesis of Hindu Dvesha. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the Europeans, for a very long period of time, you know, at least for six, seven hundred years, have been, you know, misrepresenting uh, the Hindus. But the Hindu phobia or Hindu dvesha actually became very systematized and institutionalized with the writings of James Mill, who produced uh, three volumes on the history of British India in 1818. Uh, 18. And given that uh, James Mill was also a very, very important figure in East India Company. He was actually able to uh, influence the government, governmental policies in India and India actually had uh, a massive impact because of his writings. Now, without going into too many details because I will be repeating myself, uh, James Mill basically wrote seven chapters on Hinduism and his uh, entire agenda was to describe Hindus and Hinduism as hierarchical and oppressive. And this was done within the context of showing that the Hindus were basically savage and primitive people who had no uh, idea of civilization. 
and uh, in the last of the seven uh, of of the seven chapters you know these are some of the things that he's he has spoken about uh, hindus are hierarchical oppressive they're women abusers they're effeminate they're inhuman they're villainous they're timid they're weak they're coward they're lazy they're penurious they're greedy filthy superstitious and fatalistic now you would also remember that i had made the statement that the narrative that you find in the textbooks today they are basically the sanitized version of what was put in place earlier so you know it nowhere in the text very clearly you will find written that hindus are dirty and filthy people but what they will do is that they will insert pictures in the text right from the very beginning which will begin to give the impression that hindus are lazy are 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 lazy filthy and dirty and this representation basically begins to have an impact on the children because uh this sort of a narrative is actually introduced to them at a very very early age i had also mentioned in my previous uh, webinar that in in order to define or characterize the hindus james mill was basically saying that the hindus have a social system that is hierarchical and oppressive they have a governmental system or they had a governmental system right from the very beginning of the time which was hierarchical and oppressive their taxation uh, structure also was was oppressive and basically select classes of people or a minority of people basically abused and oppressed the majority of their own people this is you know the crux of this narrative and this narrative in many different ways you know as i have been saying uh is getting reproduced and rep and replicated what has happened now is that this has become subtle and until and unless we hindus are not familiar with what james mill wrote on us 200 years ago we will not be able to find the influence of that narrative on the current narrative i had also mentioned in the earlier uh, webinar that the history of british india became a very very important text ronald indian in imagining india calls the text as hegemonic text and why was that text hegemonic it was hegemonic because it became a required reading for the civil servants who were getting trained in in england to serve in india and all the subsequent books that were written in england or india on india's history basically used james mill's history of british india as the template so i basically like to say or call that james mill is not an individual james mill is a tradition james mill is a parampara and this tradition has been continuing for a very long period of time and it has a direct influence on what is being written uh i have so much materials that both krishna and i are writing a book on this you know so uh, i won't go into those details but what i'm going to do is i will uh show to you how this narrative has actually acquired a subtle dimension as you might be as you must be seeing on the screen you know when when hinduism is basically spoken about or when the details of hinduism are given hinduism 
is linked with caste. In fact, you know, if you look, look at the sequence of chapters that are there in school textbooks, even before the sublime or the profound ideas of Brahm, yoga, meditation, worship, bhakti, and so on and so forth are introduced, caste is spoken about first. So what these textbooks do is that they begin orienting the students right from the very beginning, or you can say that they start prejudicing the students right from the very beginning. And as the text you know, moves forward, very, very important concepts like karma and dharma, they are also linked to jati and caste. And I will give you uh, an example here where jati is basically being conflated with karma. This is from McGraw Hill's uh, uh, World History textbook. Beliefs such as reincarnation also made many Indians more accepting of the jati system. A devout Hindu believed that the people in a higher jati were superior and deserved their status. At the same time, the belief in reincarnation gave hope to people from every walk of life. A person who leads a good life is reborn into a higher jati. Now, you know, this is, this is a very interesting spin. As you would know, you know, the, the idea of karma has been central not only to the Vedantic and Vedic traditions, but also to uh, Hinduism and, Buddha, uh, sorry, uh, Buddhism and Jainism. Now, when, you know, karma is being discussed in the context of Buddhism, there is a different color to it or there is a different spin. But when karma is being used in the context of Hindus and Hinduism, this is the kind of representation that you get. Now, let me come to the next one, you know, where dharma, uh, dharma is conflated with, with jati or caste. Now this is, you know, this is about uh, uh, Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita. In it, the deity Krishna goes off with a prince into battle. The prince does not want to fight because members of his family are on the other side. Krishna reminds the prince to, observe, to obey his duty as a warrior. The prince makes the painful choice to fight, to fight his family. Now, what are the different tropes that you find here? You know, in the, just uh, these four sentences. What you find is that, you know, that Hinduism is basically a violent religion. That's, you know, that's the first trope or there's the first idea which is getting conveyed over here. And Krishna is basically a war god. Now, of course, Arjuna is not mentioned here, but, you know, but Arjuna was the one who was uh, having his dilemma. And we all know that, uh, you know, he didn't basically... Uh, want to fight his kith and kin in the battle of Kurukshatra and you know and the entire story with the Bhagavad Gita. But what this text write is, writes is Krishna reminds the prince to obey his duty as a warrior. Here, in a very very subtle way, conflation of you know Varnashram Dharma where the Hinduism is actually occurring. So I just wanted to give you these two examples and you know, and there are many that are uh, prevalent and, and abound. Now, I had also mentioned that uh, in one of the chapters, James Mill had devoted considerable time in showing that Hindu 
governance system was basically oppressive. So there are two examples, you know, that I have taken from the text. Uh, examples of Chandragupta as well as Ashoka. And of course, you know, Chandragupta is described as, as the Hindu king. So this is, you know, this is the description of, uh, of Chandragupta. Chandragupta was afraid of being poisoned. So he had servants taste his food before he ate it. He was so concerned about being attacked that he never slept for two nights in a row in the same bed. Now, how is Ashoka, you know, his grandson compared to him? And the comparison basically is not a comparison between the two of them, but it is a comparison between Hinduism and Buddhism, whereas Buddhism is characterized as an emancipatory or a liberatory tradition. So what does the text read? After one battle, Ashoka looked at the fields covered with dead and wounded shoulders, uh, soldiers. He was horrified by what he saw. He decided that he would follow Buddhist teachings and become a man of peace. You know, the conversion of uh, Buddha is being sp spoken about, but you know, there's a bit of controversy here in the sense that uh, there's very clear evidence if you look at uh, you know, some of the original texts that the conversion of Ashoka to Buddhism did not happen, uh, you know, during or after the Kalinga war. Uh, he had already converted, if you will. I mean, if we can use this Christian language, you know, the, the, the idea of uh, conversion and following, you know, different traditions within uh, the Sanadhan Dharma has a very different character uh, altogether. But I won't go into the details of that comparison over here. So Ashoka kept his promise. During the rest of his life, he tried to improve the lives of his people. Ashoka made laws that encouraged good deeds, family harmony, nonviolence, and toleration of other religions. He created hospitals for people and for animals. He built fine roads with rest houses and shade trees for the traveler's comfort. Now, you know, if you look at Arthashastra, which was written during the times of his grandfather, this was what a good king supposed to be doing. I mean, these were the injunctions that, that were placed uh, on the king. And what Ashoka was essentially doing was that he returned to the dharma or raj dharma which was explicated or expounded in dharma shastra uh, in 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 artha shastra but all these civic activities of ashoka are now being discussed under the guise of his conversion to buddhism so basically, you know, in very subtle ways, what the message gets conveyed is that Hinduism is hierarchical and oppressive, whereas Buddhism is emancipatory and liberatory. And it is basically because of the oppressive practices which were there in Hinduism, which of course carried a very different name at that point in time, that Buddhism even came about. Now, you know, what is, what is the cause of all this? You know, um, before Krishna and I jumped into the fray, you know, uh, when this narrative in textbooks uh, was being fought, people were basically fighting the battle on the basis of evidence. 
and because of our orientation and maybe you know uh, because of our uh, studies and critical studies we could very clearly see that this matter was not about evidence alone and that this battle would not be won on the basis of evidence alone you know one we clarification really needed big big upon one one quick clarification here when yeah. gundan is talking about evidence he's talking about archaeological evidence right and you'll get into other evidences in a bit but i just want to be very very explicit that we've been fighting these battles on the basis of primarily of archaeological evidence yes and uh, you know and let me let me expand uh, on 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 that a little bit you know so it's not that you know that we are not denying uh, evidence or the importance of evidence but what we also recognized was that this entire narrative you know was created crafted fostered within the framework or paradigm of what is called orientalism at this point in time and people who are familiar with orientalism you know will also understand that it was basically racism which has underlined the creation of this narrative and i don't need to dwell into too many uh, you know or rather go into too many details it is about the superiority of the white people or it is about the superiority of the colonizers because of which this narrative has actually been created and the uh, influence of racism on the narrative is being systematically analyzed you know we are working on that there will be uh you know more pieces of writing which will actually get produced um uh in the in the, in 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 the in the next a few days but you know i just want to emphasize here what albert memmi has spoken about in the colonizer and the colonized where he basically examines the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized from a universal perspective he basically says that you know in the dialectical relationship between the colonizer and the and the colonized there is a cultural gulf between the colonizer and the colonized and this gulf deliberately gets created by the colonizer vis-a-vis the colonized and the colonizer spends time effort money and tremendous amount of writing and resources in order to create a certain narrative on the colonized and this narrative essentially is mythical it is false it does not have to do anything with reality now because of the process of coloni- of of colonization it is true that the colonizer ends up creating the colonized in the light of his imagination and deliberately using his over here but when the colonizer begins the process of colonization and when the colonizer begins to write on the colonizer the narrative is essentially false and mythical then he says that the relationship is basically based on exploitation benefiting the colonizer and the differences between the colonizer and 
the colonized are stated as absolute facts where the colonizer of course has an upper hand all the time i will you know take a few more minutes and then i will hand it over to uh, to krishna now we are addressing this question that you know why why does this problem not go away you know what what is it which is making this narrative persist you know from a post colonial perspective it is increasingly being realized that this narrative has a long history and this narrative is part of the mainstream discourse the western world spends a lot of time money and resources to see to it that the discourse does not change and that discourse is prevalent in universities books continually get written on those narratives in a certain sense you can say that uh, the the narrative is continually getting refreshed and of course you know people are making their own contributions in journals and uh, and various domains of media if you will now the resistance on the other hand you know has been very very weak in the sense that we do not have the infrastructure you know we have not been uh, uncovering this problem systematically we have not been addressing this problem systematically and when i say this you know i mean at the level of community and it is basically because of this that the uh problem persists now you know the way krishna and i work with indopedia is that i take care of the academic academic matters and krishna takes care of the administrative matters so what i'm going to do now is that i will hand it over to krishna and uh, you know i will be your scribe now so you know i will move uh, the the screen and when you're done uh, with the slide you know just let me know and i will move to the next one yeah i'm actually asking ankur to share it because we also need the audio in one of the upcoming slides um so let me talk about this a little bit oh, while okay. we do that slide handover to ankur um so not on the previous slide still um so when we talk about what the state of this ecosystem is Akundan, of course, has lived through it. it. He has somehow survived. He's one of the very few professors that have survived in the history social sciences while continuing to do this work. Um, but even in history social sciences, that there's various different domains. It is fairly rare to come across a professor in Indology or in Hinduism that is a practicing Hindu. Um, you've heard of what's happened at Rutgers. And Professor Trotsky is not a practicing Hindu. and that is a very very common place thing every once in a while you will run into a professor that is a practicing hindu and have a conversation with them about their experience as part of the work we did in california we reached out to a great many professors to get endorsements for the letters we needed academic endorsements because our opponents in a lot of ways were placed uh, on a pedestal as academics and in fact were presenting the sole academic voice on this and as the experts of course their voices needed to be listened to we found some professors that were later on in their careers willing to endorse to the not to the same number as those were that were willing to engage against but we also saw friendly academics that were very supportive of our work and in fact would even help behind the scenes but they didn't want their names associated with it and there were some academics that were also hindu that were also doing reasonably good work but they were afraid to exchange emails with us 
they're afraid to get on a full lest it get out that their name was involved. And then in hindsight, we thought about why is this fear there to engage, to use your name in public when the opposition so easily puts their name in public. The 200 number here comes from a letter that was sent to the California State Board where they put their names. And when challenged, some of them admitted they had not even read the letter, but they, they were willing to put their name. But the Hindu community and the Hindu academics were not. And that goes from this ecosystem that directly impacts their career, that impacts their path to getting tenureship at their universities. And so they need to keep their heads down. And their lack of support from the community that, that gives them financial security for their future. So all of these things interplay in terms of the ecosystem, when we talk about this ecosystem. On the other hand, if you're anti-Hindu or willing to produce scholarship that aligns to the James Mill Parampara, you are rewarded. You're rewarded through grants, you're rewarded through tenureship, and so many different ways through the academic ecosystem. We've started to understand this broadly, but we haven't begun to participate in a resistance movement or to fight it. And consequently, when you see academic work done around history and science related to Hinduism, it never comes from the social scientists, social sciences fields. Those professors tend to be science professors, computer science, math, uh, physics, biology, the hard sciences, because their academic career sits outside of this ingrained ecosystem where they're not impacted because it's far away and their, their career depends on the hard scientists where, sciences where they are somewhat protected based on the quality of the work that they do. Next slide. So the impact here starts with the children. The examples we gave are horrendous enough when they stand alone, but the reality is they don't stand alone. You spent, by the time you enter the sixth grade in California and the seventh, eighth, ninth, or 10th grade in the rest of the country, as a child, you've heard from your parents, Meta, be a good kid, son or daughter, whoever it is, and listen to your teacher. Study those materials, do well on those tests. Okay, Papa, we'll go do that. Year after year after year. Now, if you go to them when, when they get to this curriculum, most parents aren't aware, so they don't tell them to not pay attention. And frankly, at that point, if they tell them to pay attention, it doesn't work. The parents are ignored. They've already been brainwashed by their own parents to, to take in what's being given. Um, so, so then they go to the teachers who are teaching about this hateful tradition, but this curriculum isn't on its own either. They've gone through Christianity, Judaism, at this point, Islam comes later, but, but by and large, the pictures are amazing. The descriptions are amazing. Why wouldn't you want to be Christian or Judaic coming out of that, especially if you look at the, these, this hateful tradition of Hinduism? And so we start there. However, remember that we're still a small percentage of this country. And so most of the other children are systematically taught racism in parallel. Their traditions are amazing, but then this tradition that one or two kids in your classroom follow is hateful. And so from that perspective, well, it's very natural to bully. You're not even intending to bully, but you do. And of course, the Hindu children are being bullied. And so there's this interplay between the children that are Hindu and non-Hindu in this room in a very painful situation for these kids. What happens? They depart from the tradition. They don't always go home and say, mommy, papa, I don't wanna be a Hindu. Although we have plenty of examples of that actually happening. Many of them just veer away silently. They'll continue to go to Sunday school, but they won't believe it anymore. If we have a home practice, it gets undone as well. You don't find out about it for years. They go to college. They continue to stay away. They marry. Well, they didn't marry a Hindu, and even if they did, their kids don't end up being practicing Hindus. And in the worst of cases, they support the hateful tradition narrative. On the other side, 
you get shows like CNN's Believer from a couple of years ago. Yeah, the narrator wasn't Hindu, but he wasn't a racist bigot intending to be racist. He was just doing what their experts and scholars say. And yeah, the specific sect can be interesting and, and drive TRP. So great, let's do that one. But then he didn't do that for every single mainstream tradition. We were singled out. And I'm willing to bet there were collaborators that, are, collaborators that were Hindu, that were supporting this narrative. How many of us who are outstanding Hindus believe that Buddhism was a reflection or an improvement upon Hinduism? That was brought in the text. I had that debate with one of my son's uh, friend's dad. He says, yes, Hinduism is an improvement. What do you mean it's not? What do you mean it's wrong to teach that it is? And why is that? Well, that's what he had been taught as a kid growing up in India. And so this was very aligned. Now, the conversation ended with a very poignant question that I put to him, which was, I know you believe this. There's nothing I can say that will convince you otherwise. But when did you critically analyze the thing that you were taught? And he paused and he said, never. How many of us fall in that very same category? Uh, Kundan, if you could stop sharing, Ankur is ready to take over. Oh, great. Okay. Right, and Ankur will start with the picture of the dodo bird. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great place to transition. So why fight it? Um, the dodo bird's an interesting example. Um, and, and the quote here is from, from a website that, that I didn't attribute, but the European caused the extinction of the dodo bird. They lost the ability to fly. They adapted to terrestrial life. The conformation of their body changed and their wings atrophied. There are a lot of parallels here. Yes, the Europeans did not cause the extinction of the Hindus, but we did lose the ability to fly. Think about all the work that was produced before the Europeans and before the Islamic invasions in India. The work continued to be produced while we were fighting Islam in India. But then we adapted to European life. We had the Anglicized Hindus that went to Europe to be trained as civil servants of colonial India. Some of those stayed in positions of power post-independence. We have entire universities full of such scholars today. And the confirmation of our body, the Hindu community has changed. How many of us have said chalta hai? Or I've had friends who said chalta hai. Why fight it? It's too complicated. It's too hard. Our wings have simply atrophied. This is the state of reality. Now, we can choose to not fight it and go completely the way of the dodo bird. Maybe it won't be this generation. Maybe it won't be next generation. Maybe it's in three generations. Maybe it's in four. But who knows? Maybe it will be the first or second. Either way, that's the direction we're headed if as a community we don't decide to wake up and do something different. The fact that a hundred of you showed up to this webinar is inspiring, but that's a hundred roughly based in the US out of a population of 3 million. Next slide. So what did California look like? Next slide once more, Ankur. And so if we look at what happened in California, can you just build a slide out, please? So, so if we look at what happened in California, there it starts with something called the history social science standards. Uh, click once more. There, that is set up through the California legislature and approved by the California governor. California has the most detailed standards of any state in the US. And it has exactly five points. So that level of detail is illustrating given that that stands above and apart everyone else. Once that is approved, and this was approved a long, long time ago, then you get into something called the California History Social Science Framework. We were engaged in the refinement of this from 2015 to 2016. Then after that in 2017 is the textbook approval process. And then there's the textbook edits and corrections phase, which, which happened from there on through 2020. In this, look at the number of bodies that were involved. 
the State Board of Education, the Industrial Instructional Quality Commission, the History Social Science Subcommittee of the Instructional Quality Commission. They then appointed framework authors, which were outsourced somewhat to a body called CHSSP at UC Davis. They created these IMR CRE panels. There were others behind the scenes that were involved that were never made public, even though that's illegal. Um, there were the publishers who were working in parallel. As a community, we provided public oral testimony and public written comment in thousands of letters and, and statements. At the end of it, something happened, but by and large, we'll, we'll talk about what happened, but, but think about the bureaucracy. This is government bureaucracy that's no different anywhere in the world, but it's the most bureaucratic in California because we spend the money to make it that bureaucratic, which also means to change it, we have to engage all of these bodies now, if you went to CHSSP at UC Davis in 2015, you were way too late. You should have been engaging in 2010. The framework authors did their work. And then we came in in 2015 at the History Social Science Subcommittee level, as did many others from the community. Now, in, after 2020, the process was handed over to roughly 1,100 districts who were then engaged in the process of adoption. That process is still going and will continue through next year. Now, when you look at these districts, there are 1,100 school boards in California alone. That means 1,100 superintendents of education and 1,100 subcommittees and 1,100 different processes. We have to engage in all of that for anyone that gets through this complicated process in the middle, which is at the California State Board level. Now, this wasn't something we had mapped out at the beginning. We, we stumbled through this process like the rest of the community. But we did map it out towards the end to make sure that when we engage the next time, we would do so in a more systematic manner. Next slide. And so when we talk about accomplishments, I want to be very, very clear. We should celebrate our wins, but we should remember that the glass isn't completely full. We didn't win. Now, we didn't lose either. And we made steps forward, but we didn't win in an absolute sense. Next slide. And so if we look at California gives us a stick to wield and we used it at the framework level and at the textbook level. And the stick that it uniquely gives us in this country, it's the only state that does, is that in the legislature, there is an education code and it specifically states educational materials should not stereotype adversely to reflect, demean or ridicule religious beliefs. It should also not promote religious and, oh, sorry, it should promote religious and cultural diversity, instill a sense of pride in one's religion, eradicate roots of prejudice, and help develop a feeling of self-worth. Great. We all thought, let's leverage this, and we did. And we'll see what happened. Next slide. We went through this process at the state board level. And there were hits and misses and the controversy that I'm sure everyone is aware of, of India versus Hinduism happened. There were a number of meetings that happened in the front and by and large, we lost. At that point, Kundan did submit a very, very strong letter, which I'll quote. In the framework, Hinduism is discussed between these pages and between these lines. And of them, um, they discussed the issue of caste, which basically leaves 15 lines dedicated to other issues. Um, and then they overemphasize caste, essentializing the conflation of Hinduism with caste and limiting the portrayal of Hinduism and narrowing its expanse because everything was caste centric. In other words, frame, the framework singles out Hinduism, exposing its adherence, our kids, to ridicule and subtly portrays it to be inferior. In the contemporary world, no kid wants to be associated with such a belief. So in other words, if we're hierarchical and oppressive, you're directly impacting a kid's belief in his religion. And so Hinduism is, because it's presented as inherently hierarchical and oppressive, and is not a ma ma matter of considerable academic debate, singling it out for these negative portrayals tantam is tantamount to prejudice and discrimination. It's time for them to wake up. This is one of the largest, most important letters that were submitted. And what we know at the end of this, and we'll go into it again, was there was a significant impact behind the scenes between the final hearing with the IQC and um, on the framework and what was eventually published 
as the framework after the process was complete and we moved into the textbook round. Next slide. In fact, Krishna, you know, I would yep. want to add here that when I made this analysis, you know, the framework had already been finalized and the change happened, you know, later, uh, later after this letter was actually submitted. So, you know, what change occurred, you know, you can go into that, you know, we'll talk about the reduction, um, you know, of uh, caste hierarchy and oppression related discourse on Hinduism. But, you know, I'll, I'll leave that for you to expand upon. So next slide. Um, and here, Ankur, if you can click on uh, Commissioner Jocelyn in that picture, that's actually a video. Or maybe not. The video didn't go through, it looks like. Okay, so I'll just read the quote then. Uh, go back. All right, so that was supposed to be a video of her speaking around sec um, 39 seconds into the script. At the, and this is, she was a commissioner in the instructional uh, IQC, Instructional Quality Commission, Subcommittee on India and Hinduism. Sorry, Subcommittee on the History Social Science, um, the History Social Science Subcommittee. And after a very long pause, um, and just, just a little more context, there are a bunch of commissioners, there are eight or nine in number, and it's largely an echo chamber. No one likes to raise their voice, and when they do, everyone else can, tends, tends to agree. That's just the nature of how this body works, as we saw over the last couple of years prior to this. So she takes a long pause, a deep breath in, and then she says, the only other thing I would like to bring to the committee, and this is with regards to the discussion on Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, is that I would like to cite two of the documents in public comment after reviewing public comment associated with this program. And then for document 929 did, named 9-25 by Hindupedia, this was the second one. Number one, page 31 to 51 of these documents listing 37 recommended edits and corrections. And of those one through 16 and 21 to 57 are recommended. If you actually open that letter, None of those are actually edits and, and corrections because we weren't asked to submit edits and corrections. The way the process worked was we were asked to support or reject the set of materials. Now, these comments that, that she is specifically recommending all commented and asked for the rejection of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt's two programs that they had submitted. And for context, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt is the largest publisher of children's instructional materials in the US. And as a consequence of her standing up and being willing to support us after engagement with her over the preceding year, it resulted in everyone else saying, okay, with the exception of Bill Honig, who was the chair, who pushed back explicitly hard saying, well, what about one textbook? What about one year instead of the rest? And he tried very hard to rescue it and it was explicit. But at the end of the day, we got agreement from the other commissioners agreeing to reject Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Now, the way this works is the subcommittee makes a recommendation. They don't actually reject anybody. That subcommittee goes to the full Instructional Quality Commission, who makes a recommendation to the state board, who then accepts that recommendation at the state board, and then it becomes official. But, but this meeting at this subcommittee was key to that rejection. Houghton Mifflin Harcourt had roughly 50% market share in California. Now, Kundan made a number of quotes from McGraw-Hill's textbooks that approved, that were approved coming out of this process. They're egregious, as you saw. And, and so when we talk about glass half full, glass half empty, yes, we got the biggest publisher rejected. The second largest went through with barely a scratch and all of the key horrendous tenants in place. Next slide. So what happened? In the framework, at the end, after it got approved, Kundan submitted his letter and what got published, there was a 50% reduction in the Hinduism caste hierarchy oppression discourse. The state board rejected Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Yay! Um, they not, not only got rejected in the middle school, they got rejected in K through eight in California. Two programs for eight years, only three, two of which years impact India and Hinduism until 2028 caused a 14% drop in their market capitalization. They're a public company, remember. So, so significant revenue impact, they had roughly 50% share. 
Um, our ongoing work outside, we work with discovery in the process. We continued engaging with them. And I believe we played a key role in them exiting the history social sciences business altogether. So we won a couple additional market share points. Yeah. Right Now, however, the state standards aren't changed. The framework is still Hindu Dweshi. All the other textbooks yeah. are terrible. And McGraw-Hill, the second largest publisher in the US and the second largest in California is by and large win winning the market share that Hot Mifflin Harcourt got, had to evacuate. Pearson was somewhat better, and TCI is the least bad. And guess what? The entire market is going to these three. Now, we're talking about California, but, but one thing through our engagement with publishers we learned, and we suspected beforehand, but we learned, is that they don't produce books for California. They produce books for the US. And those books adopt and adhere to California standards where California defines them. Similarly, in the sciences where Texas has an issue, they create books that adhere to Texas. And they put that in something that's a compendium for each of these topics. When it's in this compendium, when they go to another state, if the state doesn't have something that says, don't do this, that California requires, they get the thing that was produced in California. They don't wanna produce these materials twice. And as a consequence, these books that are approved in California are making their way right now through all of the other states in the US. Next slide. So we didn't stop there. Coming out of that, um, the process, because McGraw-Hill was so egregious, we produced the work Making Children Hinduphobic, a critical review of McGraw-Hill's world history textbooks. Keep in mind, these are textbooks that are approved in California for grade six and seven, which are covered in other states in grade six or grade seven or grade eight or nine or 10. We look through a large number of states requirements. There is no social history, social science framework in any other state. Their standards are more general than those that California requires, almost as a rule. If I'm off by maybe one by a line, then that may be the case but from everyone that we saw. In order to properly engage with these publishers, we had to create an alternate history social science framework specifically on the chapters that relate to Hinduism and India. And we did that under the constraints that had to largely fit within the construct and the topics that California required. So where we would have wanted to introduce new topics, we refrained. It wasn't perfect, but, but we believed it would be close enough to the California framework that it would be acceptable in California, far enough away that it would no longer be Hindu Dwishi. That was signed by 11 history social science academics, six scholars in history social sciences and non-history social science academics, five academic and scholarly organizations, three sampradays, and seven social and cultural organizations. All in, those signatories represented more than 1 million Hindus residing in the US, and of course, tens of millions when you look at their global following. A lot of these numbers are driven by the three sampradays, although there is one very large social and cultural organization that signed as well. Did we get all the sampradays? No. Did it take a long time? Yes. Now, how many documents have been produced by anyone that are signed by three sampradays? In the US? I'd be challenged to push for one, maybe there is one. But, but this endeavor took almost a year to happen between creating the document, actually the creating the document was the easy part and that took six months, if I remember correctly, um, and the signatory process, which took nine months. So we overlapped by about three because we had reviews uh, where they got to present their feedback and, and that got incorporated to make sure we went together and move forward as a community. Next slide. Krishna, you would also want to uh, tell people that uh, this book is available on Amazon and the Kindle version is free. So, you know, people would want to uh, go through the book and basically, um, you know, help raise awareness, not only in themselves, but also in people around them. Yeah. And the other thing I will add is this, the reason we made this book available freely is because we wanted to enable others. 
Yeah. Right. Hindupedia's mission, by and large, is academic and educational to fix the academic system. And we were hoping people would take inspiration. And we were surprised when, when people did. This was useful in Massachusetts. I've heard that it's being used by activists in um, other states as well. They're limited in number, but we did make, make progress. Krishna, we're um, uh, almost out of time. Um, are, are we close to finishing your... Yes, we are. One more slide. So are we done? No, unfortunately. This is a long-standing effort. Since the close of the California process, we've reached out to 1,100 California school districts and realized exactly how hard it is. We've made some progress, but, but very, very limited. We met with the Indian Prime Minister's office through multiple meetings, made some progress, but, but very little. Um, I talked about the influence in several states. In the academic front, we've presented at eight conferences, made five invitational lectures, published three chapters in three different books, and one article. This work will continue to happen. Um, and, and so this, this is not something we're done with by any means. All right, with that, over to you, Jaiji. All right, thank you very much. Uh, um, I think there's a lot of, lot of work that's been done. Uh, obviously, uh, more needs to be done. Uh, but, but thank you for sharing all that uh, trials and tribulations with, uh, with us and uh, with, with our uh, audience of 400 people. Um, I, I do have a few slides that I wanted to share, but I think in the interest of time, uh, perhaps I should just uh, uh, go to the question and answers. Uh, our audience had a number of questions, so if you'd allow me to uh, ask a few of them. Uh, first of all, uh, are Jans and Sikhs also affected, or all this uh, uh, venom is uh, directed at Hindus only? So Jans and Sikhs are affected, but to a lesser extent. Uh, primarily because there's less coverage, right? Jans and Sikhs get half a page to a page of coverage, so there's not as much space to write negatively about them, but they are impacted. Okay. Um, let's see. So what is needed to, uh, to repeat the California success story uh, uh, in, in other places? Uh, okay. Yeah, so just one, if you want to engage directly, take these materials to your local congressman, uh, to your state legislature, and push for change. If you can do it at the state level, nothing beats the leverage you will get. You can do it at a district level, but that is a really, really hard thing to do, given the number of districts. And then, of course, you should engage directly with your school where your kids are learning when they get to the grade, when these materials are taught, and intervene directly at the teacher level to protect your kids specifically. Uh, there was a question about caste. Uh, you know, there was a, a recent book on uh, on caste that was uh, given a lot of publicity. Um, the the uh, our viewer asked, uh, "How do we fight these issues?" I mean, they are not directly related to your subject per se. I mean, uh, but but obviously, it does affect what goes into you know what what narrative gets kind of uh, you know spread out there and how it affects the uh, you know, our kids. Uh, any thoughts on how we can fight these general Hindu Dweshi uh, narratives? Yeah, and the general yeah. answer is you have to support the academic ecosystem to create that resistance. So don't give money blindly to, to Rutgers where, with, where Audrey is because it goes to her. You have to be very specific in how you support academics and the grants that are provided. Um, but that is the only way to do it. You have to give them security to publish work that that does oppose this. Okay. Uh, uh, writing, by writing and publishing, basically, JJ, you know, that's how it's going to change, you know. Uh, sure. Krishna and I are working on a book, you know, which should come out uh, in a year or so. Uh, it should make an impact, you know. We yeah. won't go into too many details at this point in time, uh, but uh, we, are, we are working on it. Well, I mean, it, it ultimately boils down to uh, our community supporting these efforts and, uh, you know, uh, directing their... Um, uh, their philanthropical, uh, I mean, contributions towards the right, uh, right kind of activities. I, I think I have a couple of slides that I basically touch on the same subject since it's all about uh, how community can help. Uh, I think it's worthwhile knowing where we stand and where we can be uh, on that. So allow me to share uh, those two or three slides. Um, 
Okay. So I think you, uh, you know, you you heard at great length from uh, you know these two uh, scholars about what is you know what happened in California case. Obviously, the message you get is it's it is it is a tough fight. It's very complicated. It requires a lot of uh, you know there are a lot of moving parts. It requires um, a lot of things to happen. Um, but you know, ultimately, um, we achieved. Um, I'd say more than partial success, although uh, some Hindu Deshi content is still out there, and and uh, you know this work will uh, never quite stop. So, you know, is this something that we can effectively fight as a community uh, on a sustained basis? I mean, the answer has to be yes, clearly. You know, if you look, if you think about, you know, you just take yourself back to 9/11, and you would you would have said. Boy, this you know the the Muslim community in this in this country is going to be really in a bad shape as a result of that you know major traumatic event in this in this society. And yet, 20 years later, um, you know they are in a in a very comfortable position. As a matter of fact, they probably put us Hindus on a on a back foot on in many of the areas. So clearly, it is possible with the right kind of determination and resources. It is possible. To change the narrative in the society, and uh, I think this slide basically says it all. You know, life is like making sausages; you pretty much get what you put into it. So uh, this this conversation tonight is not about fundraising. I'm not going to be putting out a link, uh, uh, you know, where you can send your money. But we do have to, as a community, we do have to have a mature conversation about about money and about resources. Uh, so on that, uh, I just wanted to share what are the uh, charitable giving practices of different faith groups. Uh, this this uh, chart here shows what I know of uh, the the prescribed practices of different faith groups. So Christian um, Christians they are supposed to contribute ten percent of their annual income. Um, the term is called teeth and. It's prescribed, I mean, it's, it's supposed to be mandatory. Uh, what percentage of people actually give 10% is open to question. Interestingly enough, uh, the African American contribution, uh, according to government figures, reaches almost 8%. So, so it's, uh, you know, 10% is not an outlandish figure. Now, the Jewish community also has the TIF system also 10% of the annual income, but it's not mandatory. Uh, and yet we know that Jewish community is very effective in, uh, you know, in, the, in the public square. So there is, there is a lot of money that's, that's coming from the Jewish community at large uh, towards uh, this kind of issue. Uh, now Islam has a system called zakat. It's supposed to be two and a half percent and yes, it's supposed to be mandatory. And when I say mandatory, it's within quotation marks. Uh, I'm sure you know some people give less, some people give a lot more, but uh, there is there is a uh, there is a system of uh, giving that's kind of prescribed in the you know in the faith. Hindus, um, uh, we don't have a prescription per se, and of course nothing is mandatory, um, but we do have a we do have a long tradition of giving. Um, I you know by this uh, chart i know by no means want to imply that hindus actually do not give to uh, philanthropic causes but let's look at some figures so this is uh, uh, you know it, it, this kind of data is a little bit hard to get this is based on 2017 to 2018 uh, some published data from government so us government sources and uh, the data I have is that the average American household contributes a uh, little over $2,500 a year per household. Um, whereas the Hindu American household contributes roughly 2000 a year. Okay, this is based on uh, some published report, a little bit open to question, it's been imputed, it's an imputed number. Um, I think it was uh, the total aggregate figure was over a little over 2 billion which comes out to about $2,000 per year per household. Now that doesn't look uh, terribly out of, uh, you know, um, uh, terribly out in terms of, uh, you know, uh, magnitude relative to the, the uh, uh, average American household. 
But when you look at on a different scale, uh, the percentage of annual income, the American household uh, contribution comes out to about 4% of the annual income. Whereas the Hindu household in, uh, contribution comes out to only about 2%. And uh, it rests on the fact that uh, Hindu Americans, the average household income is almost twice as much as that of the national average. So that's a pretty big, uh, that's a pretty big gap. Uh, and uh, that gap actually uh, represents roughly $2 billion in 2017, 18 dollars. If you look at the income today, uh, that number would be significantly larger than the two billion. You know, um, so that's that's one that's one area where I think Hindu community at large needs to think about, you know, uh, upping their game in this in this arena. The other thing is uh, a great deal of our Hindu contribution goes to uh, goes towards uh, uh, religious places, uh, mandirs. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not against temples by any stretch of the imagination. I think, uh, you know, we need temples. They, they do a great job. Um, but we need to find a way to engage them in, uh, you know, social dialogue, in, in helping with, uh, with, you know, education, in helping with uh, carrying on the dialogue about how, you know, about Hindu dvesha and how to, how to counter Hindu Dvesha. So on that, um, I will uh, stop uh, sharing. And if there are any other questions in the chat box, we'll take them. Uh, otherwise we can, we can close the, let's see, there are a number of questions that came up after I, let's see. Um, <clears throat> So how do we publicize headlines of Hindu Dvesha news and general knowledge about Hindu Dvesha to Hindus at large in USA? Um, I guess, let me, uh, uh, let me take this, uh, this question. Uh, this, this entire initiative of Hindu Dvesha that we have been, um, that we have launched, and this is third webinar, is not limited to just educational webinars like this. Uh, we have a, um, a very uh, ambitious plan to actually monitor the, uh, uh, you know, the the news media, the social media, the various, uh, you know, print as well as entertainment me uh, media, and um, and publish uh, publish maybe quarterly or annual reports and highlight what is going on uh, with respect to Hindu dvesha in these various channels. So that is one way um, we would, uh, we, you know, we put out last time we put out uh, a request to uh, to the audience to see how many people would want to volunteer in this cause. We actually got a lot of, uh, you know, a lot, lot of volunteers stepping up to the plate and we're talking to a number of them. And um, so this is an effort that obviously is going to uh, pick up steam as we gather uh, more and more uh, volunteers to to be part of this activity. Let's see. <clears throat> Is Hindu Dvesha a Hindu think tank? I mean, I don't know how to answer that question. Um, it's uh, it's meant to be a place where we talk about uh, uh, what. Uh, sorry, is Hindupedia a Hindu think tank? Krishna ji, uh, do you want to take that question? No. So we are a non-political organization, we're purely focused on improving academia and specifically academia in the U.S. While we've had impact kind of outside the U.S. as well, our focus is very U.S. centric. Okay, thank you. Uh, what would be a good term for Hindu Dvesha in English uh, for a non-Indian audience? So this is, this is a, an interesting dilemma for us. Um, you know, from the from the get go, uh, we had uh, we had been dis we had discussed this very issue: what to call this 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 effort, what to call this phenomenon, so to speak. And uh, our uh, you know initial go to uh, term was uh, Hindu phobia, because that's that's out there. It takes off of uh, you know a parallel term, uh, Islamophobia, but. 
our rationale for picking Hindu dvesha was, uh, well, phobia means fear. Someone has to be afraid of you to call this phenomenon as Hindu phobia. When reality is Hindu have, Hindus haven't done anything to the society that would cause anyone to be afraid of us. So it is certainly not uh, uh, phobia. So what do you call it? And we haven't come up with a good, good English term. So we've kind of latched on to Hindu Dvesha and we're hoping to uh, make, it a, make it into a well-known brand. Um, but along, alongside, we'll continue to think of a possible English term, but uh, nothing at the moment comes to mind. Yeah, we can use Hindu hatred, Hindu baiting, you know, these can be synonymously used. Yeah, so we are, you know, with Hindu dvesha, we are uh, carrying the term Hindu phobia along with it. We're calling it yeah. Hindu dvesha slash systemic Hindu phobia. So at right. least there is a way for people to kind of uh, connect with the term. And we're hoping that over time, uh, it will become, you know, come, um, come in more common use and uh, we would not have to explain it. Uh, anyway. Yeah, so uh, Chandrasekhar ji asked this question, how the contribution, Hindu contribution uh, compares with others. And hopefully I answered that uh, in my, uh, my two or three slides. Any effort to correct Wikipedia? Yeah, so let me answer that one, Jayaji, because I got it a lot in the early days of Hindupedia. And in mm -hmm. fact, I endeavored to go correct Wikipedia at the onset before starting Hindupedia and learned that like the academic ecosystem, there's also an ecosystem around Wikipedia and specifically around what is considered authoritative. And you can be Shankaracharya himself and try to make edits and you will be considered lower in authority than a random per publisher um, publishing an article on the New York Times. So yes, you could. But for Hindus, by and large, it is not worth the time until we can fix the broader academic ecosystem, because the, the way facts are prioritized and, and approved as authoritative goes against us. Thank you. I think on that, uh, on that note, it's uh, 17 past the hour. Um, it's been um, very educational. I uh, would like to thank Kundan Singh Ji and Krishna Ji for uh, their valuable time and sharing their, and of course, uh, applaud them for all the great work they have done, you know, towards the California textbook case. And uh, thank you once again for your time and uh, for, for educating uh, our viewers and us. And on that note, uh, uh, shall we call it an evening? Thank you, Jaime. Namaste. Thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you. Uh, namaste. Uh, until next time. Okay.